but if you brought your Bible with you here tonight, we are in um, Numbers chapter 17, and it's a short chapter, so hopefully we can get through it uh, here tonight with no problem as we look at um, a chapter in the Bible that speaks about Aaron's rod. Uh, and the significance behind Aaron's rod and it budding. Uh, really, there's great symbols uh, throughout this chapter and uh, God revealing to us what Aaron's rod that budded symbolizes, what it speaks of. And remember that the rod that we're going to read about here, Aaron's rod that budded or staff that budded, is actually going to be talked about in Israel's history for several thousand years. Because that rod, after this event, was taken and put in the Ark of the Covenant. So remember, there were three uh, components that were there in the Ark of the Covenant. It was Aaron's rod that budded, that we're going to read about here tonight. It was the two tables of stone, or the Ten Commandments, and then there was that jar of manna. And so we're going to look at one of those items that was in the ark uh, here tonight, Aaron's rod that budded. And remember what the picture of the ark of the covenant is. It's a picture of God's presence. Remember the Bible tells us that God's spirit dwelt there uh, among uh, the on the top of the ark of the covenant or the mercy seat. And God's spirit dwelt between the cherubim. That's where God's presence was said uh, to be. And below the cherubim and below the mercy seat then would have been the Ark of the Covenant which contained these three different items. And this was what was in the Holy of Holies. This was the object, the Ark of the Covenant, that the high priest would come in through the veil uh, one time a year, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, where he would come through the veil and he would do what? He would take the blood of that sacrificial lamb and he would drop the blood on the mercy seat. And this is what atoned for the nation's sins. One time a year as God would cover their sins. And so here tonight, these beautiful pictures of what that rod symbolizes, what the table of uh, stone, the Ten Commandments symbolizes uh, and the jar of manna that was in there, the mercy seat on top and the priest uh, dropping the sacrificial blood on the top of the mercy seat. Beautiful pictures that really relate to us as well. Great symbols and pictures and lessons to Israel, uh, but just like everything in the Bible, uh, they're important and significant to us as well. And so this is what we're going to look at here tonight in Numbers chapter 17. And so if you're already turned there, I would like to just pray one more time and we'll begin the study tonight. Father in heaven, uh, thank you, Lord. Uh, thank you for this time, Lord, and thank you for just who you are, God. As tonight we're going to see and be reminded of the great love that you have for us, God. The Bible says in 1 John that true love, perfect love, casts out fear. Uh, fear and the fear of the Lord is healthy. It's uh, good. It's the fear of the Lord that is the beginning of wisdom. But truly, wisdom will not save us, Lord, uh, experiencing your forgiveness and your love and in accepting you and receiving you as our Lord and Savior, then applies the blood. Lord, applies that blood, just like we're going to see here tonight. That blood now covers our sins. Lord, it is able to atone or take away our sins, not just cover them. And so, Father, it was this great love. And really, it is love that will begin to compel us. It is uh, the love of God that compels us now. And so, Father, uh, minister to us here, I pray. Uh, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And so Numbers chapter 17, beginning here at verse 1, says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and get from them a rod for each father's household, twelve rods from all their leaders, according to their father's household, you shall write each name on his rod and write Aaron's name on the rod of Levi. For there is one rod for the head of each of their father's households. Verse four, 
You shall then deposit them in the tent of meeting in front of the testimony where I meet with you. I will come about, uh, it will come about that the rod of the man whom I choose will sprout. Thus, I will lessen from upon myself the grumblings of the sons of Israel who are grumbling against you. Moses, therefore, spoke to the sons of Israel and all their leaders, and he gave him a rod apiece for each leader, according to their father's households, 12 rods with the rod of Aaron among their rods. So Moses deposited the rods before the Lord in the tent of testimony or the tabernacle. Verse 8 says, Now on the next day Moses went into the tent of the testimony, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi had sprouted and put forth buds and produced blossoms, and it bore ripe almonds. (laughs) Moses then brought out all of the rods from the presence of the Lord to all the sons of Israel, And they looked, and each man took his rod. But the Lord said to Moses, Put back the rod of Aaron before the testimony to be kept as a sign against the rebels, that you may put an end to their grumbling against me, so that they will not die. Thus Moses did, just as the Lord had commanded him, so he did. Verse 12. Then the sons of Israel spoke to Moses, saying, Behold, we perish, we are dying, we are all dying. Everyone who comes near, who comes near to the tabernacle of the Lord must die. Are we to perish completely? So what an amazing chapter here is God has dealt with this rebellious group. Remember last chapter, it was the family of Korah. Uh, and there are 250 leaders who rose up against Moses and Aaron. Remember, God uh, settled that dispute, or you may say he judged the rebellion when he told the rest of Israel through Moses to separate themselves from these people, to remove themselves from the rebellious because God was going to judge them. And remember what God did after giving a warning He then judged. How did he judge? Well, the earth opened up and swallowed the 250 along with Korah uh, and the other two men, Natham and Abram, who were really the leader of the leaders. And so what happened after the earth swallowed up this rebellion? It was very evident that it was God judging the rebellion. It wasn't Moses and Aaron. Uh, As great of men as they were and as close to God as they were, they didn't have the power or the authority to open the earth to judge anyone. God did. But remember the rest of the congregation. We found this in chapter 16 beginning at verse 41, that after God made it very clear that he was judging the rebellion and he destroyed the rebellion, he killed them. That then the rest of the congregation did what? They began to complain to Moses and Aaron. Now they turned to them and they said, it's your fault. It's your fault that you killed these people. How dare you? How could you? I remember again, it wasn't Moses and Aaron uh, who judged the people. It was God. And so the picture was that God became angry with even the rest of the congregation who was showing sympathy towards the rebellious whom God had judged. And this made God angry. And so what did God do? He said, stand back, Moses and Aaron, because now I'm going to destroy the rest of the congregation. So we closed last week by seeing the beautiful picture of Aaron, uh, who was the priest. He was the high priest. And these are pictures of Jesus, who is our great high priest, who did what? Who ran in the middle of the congregation as God's judgment was falling upon them for murmuring against God and showing sympathy to those who were rebelling Uh, God actually brought judgment, but as the judgment came or the plague came, Aaron ran into the center of the camp and began to make atonement for the people. Beautiful pictures of Jesus, but not without 14,000 people dying. And we looked at that last week, uh, that whenever there's sin, there's going to be death. It may not be physical death. It may be spiritual death. 
It may be a broken relationship. It may be death of a job, death of happiness, death of joy. Why? Because there's always consequences for sin. There's always casualties for sin. Uh, These little arguments that we have that are unresolved, that are sinful, produce uh, a sin and produce outgrowths and produce death. And so Moses and Aaron here, what an amazing thing, though, with Aaron running in there and offering this atonement and sparing the majority of the congregation. And so now after this rebellion, God judged the rebellion. We see these beautiful pictures of Aaron running in as the priest to offer atonement, uh, to turn God's judgment away from the people. And then we just read in verse 17, now God is continuing to make his point clear. Remember the rebellion thought that any family should be able to be the priestly family. That we all hear from God. We're all servants of God. So we don't need a leader anymore. We can just all be our own leaders. And so God judged the rebellion and said, no, uh, you guys want me to choose between right and wrong or this or that? Well, God made his choice. He made it evident. But now what he's doing is he's going to remind them. That's what we just read at the end of this chapter, uh, that Aaron's rod that budded is going to be put in the Ark of the Covenant as what? A reminder a reminder of how God judged this rebellion. And so here's what he says. God tells Moses, grab the 12 leaders. Remember, there's 12 tribes of Israel, 12 sons of Israel, 12 leaders of Israel. And God tells Moses to have each one of those leaders get a rod. And remember, the rod is just a piece of wood. Uh, It can be interchanged with the word staff. And so really it's a dead piece of wood, right? It's no longer part of a living tree and it's no longer a living branch. It's a dead piece of wood. So God says, get this dead piece of wood. Each one of the leaders, give them the piece of wood, the rod, have them write their names on it, give them back to Moses. Then Moses is to take these 12 rods to take them into the tabernacle, the place where God was dwelling with his people and leave them there. And then on the next day, when you return in there, the one that buds, the one that blossoms is the one that I choose now that I'm showing all of you that I'm choosing to be the priestly tribe. And how amazing that God even has to do this, because remember, God, at the very beginning of this exodus from Egypt, did what? Set apart the tribe of Levi, (laughs) God already told them, God already chose Levi out of the 12 tribes to be the priestly tribe. Then within that tribe of Levi, he chose the family of Aaron and Moses to be the high priest. So God already made his selection and he made it clear. But because of the rebellion, because people began to, you know, disassociate with Moses and Aaron, then God did what? God says, now I'm going to show you once again whom I'm choosing to be the high priestly uh, family. And so what happened here? They brought all of the rods in uh, and they put them there in the tabernacle. And then the next day, Moses was going to go in to see which rod budded. I want to look at a minute for a uh, look for a minute at the significance of the idea of the rod or the staff. The rod and the staff in the Bible is always a symbol of authority. The rod and the staff are always a symbol of authority. Think about um, David, who was a king, but before he was the king of Israel, he was a shepherd. And David wrote in Psalm 23, verse 4, He wrote, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You see, the shepherd understood, David understood what his staff was for. His staff or his rod did a lot of things as a shepherd of little sheep. You see that staff with the hook on the end of it, 
uh, was used by the shepherd when those stubborn sheep, <laughs> sheep are stubborn, uh, no wonder why God uh, calls us sheep because we all, like sheep, have gone astray. We can all, you know, be intrigued and enticed to look to the left and to look to the right and to follow different shepherds and all of this stuff. But what does the good shepherd do? Well, he uses that staff so that when those sheep begin to wander away, he can grab it around the neck and he can bring it back close to him. Right. The shepherd has a way of using that staff even sometimes to prod the sheep, the sheep that just want to stand there uh, and do nothing. He has a way of prodding those sheep with that staff. And so really the, the picture of this rod and this staff uh, comforting, there is great comfort when the shepherd has that staff, because remember that staff can also be used to fend off the wolves. Uh, that staff could be used to poke away at the wolves to sh- uh, save the sheep. And so the sheep would have great comfort in the shepherd, being close to the shepherd, because the symbol of authority he had is that staff, which would bring great comfort, just like to you and I. And knowing that Jesus is actually the rod of God, that Jesus is the authority of God, gives me great comfort. Knowing that Jesus is now seated at the right hand of the Father, that Jesus is in control, gives me great comfort. I can now face tomorrow without fear or trepidation. I can now look forward to tomorrow. Why? Because of the great comfort of my good shepherd who has the rod or actually is the staff or rod of God. We're going to look at here in a minute. But that rod also was used as a disciplinary thing. And so these are the symbols of the rod. In fact, remember Moses. When God called to Moses, when Moses was out there after killing the Egyptian, he was wandering around in the wilderness, kind of hopeless, kind of felt like he blew it. And uh, God's plan, whatever plan God had for him, he blew it. And so he's out there kind of sulking and and changing and just kind of accepting the life that he had until God came to Moses and revealed his plan to Moses. What did he do? He told him, get up and let's go back into Egypt. But in Exodus 4.20, God didn't just send him into Egypt empty handed. The Bible says that God told him to take his staff, that this staff now that he used as a shepherd to protect his sheep and to fend off the wolves, God now put it in his hand and said, this is now the staff of God. This is now going to be a symbol of your authority, Moses, that I am giving you. You are no longer going to use the staff with the authority over these sheep. I am now giving you, God on high is giving you this staff that it will be a symbol of my authority that has been given to you. So Exodus 4.20, that's exactly what happened as Moses made his way back to Egypt. And so God used this staff, didn't he? He used that rod that he gave Moses, a symbol of God's authority that had been placed there in Moses' hand. Remember in Exodus 7, verses 9 and 10, uh, when Moses went before the Pharaoh and the Pharaoh wanted to know, by what authority are you telling me to let your people go? Well, what was the authority? It was God's authority. And what was a way that Moses was to display God's authority? God said, throw the staff down. Throw the staff down. And when he threw it down, what happened to the staff? It turned into a serpent. And then God said, now pick the serpent up by the tail. And when he did by faith, what happened? That serpent became the staff again. It was a symbol of God's authority that God was able to turn the staff, a dead piece of wood, into a living serpent and then turn it back into a dead piece of wood. A symbol of God's authority. Pharaoh wanted to know by what authority. Well, God showed him by what authority. Oh, it didn't stop there, did it? Exodus seven seventeen. When then Moses went before the Nile River. And what did God say? Use your staff or your rod, that symbol of my authority that has been given to you, and do what? Strike the Nile. And what happened when he did? Well, the Nile turned to blood. And then when he struck it a second time, it became clean once again. Exodus 8, 5, that when God brought the plague of the frogs, it was Moses who uh, used the staff or the rod to begin this plague. 
The staff was used to you, to initiate the plague of the lice and the hail and the locust. That the staff was used as what? A symbol of God's authority that had been given uh, to Moses. Exodus 14, 16, as Pharaoh finally said, get out of here after that last plague. Moses and all of Israel wandered out into the wilderness and came to the Red Sea where they were cornered and Pharaoh was on the move looking to kill him now. And what did God do? He said, Moses, take your staff, your rod that I have given you as a symbol of my authority and raise it to the sky. What happened when he did? By faith, that Red Sea parted and all of Israel was able to cross through on their way to the promised land. They were saved, right? They were baptized, the Bible says. Uh, And then once Pharaoh and his army came, God closed the sea when Moses used the staff once again. How about in Exodus 17, verse 9? When Moses was there and he uh, was watching at a high place, he was watching Israel in battle. The Bible says that as Moses would pray and his hands were lifted up with his staff, that what? Israel would begin to have victory in battle. Exodus seventeen nine. the rod was used in prayer to give victory to Israel in battle. That rod was what? A symbol of God's authority. Numbers 20, verse 11, it was the rod that God said to Moses when the people were thirsty and there was no water and they began to do what? Complain and murmur. So God said, get your staff or your rod and strike the rock. And when he did, by faith, what happened? Water came from the rock. Psalm 2, 9, Psm 23, 4, Isaiah 10:24. Show us these beautiful pictures of the rod being a picture of God's authority over man. Psalm 2.9, in fact, says that God is the authority over all the nations. He will smash the nations with his rod. And so this rod is a symbol of God's authority over man. And we know that. The great white throne judgment. God says that every human being that ever existed... Though they die, even if they don't die in faith, having been born again and saved, will be raised from the dead and they will stand there before who? God, the judge of all. And God will judge every single person. Why? Because God has authority over mankind. Isn't it only right that the creator has authority over his creation? Not only his creation, but his creatures. That is you and I, and so the rod really is a symbol of God's authority over mankind. How fitting that in Isaiah 11:1. 1, in fact, I want to read this one. That same authority over mankind that God has, guess what he has given to Jesus? He has given Jesus now, who is called the rod of God, right? Who is called, has the title of the rod, right? That now God has given Jesus that authority. Look at Isaiah 11, I want to read a couple of these verses just as reminders uh, of God's authority over mankind. Uh, Isaiah 11, uh, 1 says, uh, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and strength, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. And he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Also, righteousness will be the belt about his loins and faithfulness the belt about his waist. Who's that speaking of? Speaking of Jesus, who is now called what? The rod and the rod from his mouth, which he's going to judge what? Not by what he hears, not by what he sees, but he's going to judge what? The intents and the motivations of the heart. Remember those eyes of fire that Revelation says that Jesus has? Those eyes of fire that can do what? That can see right through our heart, that pierces us. 
Right? Those same eyes of fire that are what? Just purging. God sees it all. This is what he's saying. Jesus isn't going to judge us by what he hears and what he sees. No, he's going to judge with all righteousness and fairness. And so the rod, uh, Jesus, is going to slay the wicked with that rod. Why? Because it's a symbol of God's authority and God's authority over man nonetheless. Interesting that in the New Testament, Paul actually follows up this concept of this rod being a symbol of God's authority. Here, the authority that had been given to Moses. It's God's authority, but it was put in Moses' hand. Paul follows this up in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 at verse 20 when he says, For the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. What do you desire? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit? of gentleness what is paul saying that even in the new testament the apostles had this rod they had this authority that had been given to god authority over the church what an amazing thing and that's a scary thing that paul says there right i mean he's talking to the corinthian church that we studied through the book of first corinthians the church was a mess remember there was incest going on and nobody was saying anything about it you know uh, there was all kinds of uh, people suing each other in the church, Christian brothers who couldn't work out their differences and settle things. They begin to sue each other and there was all kinds of things going on, gossip. And what does Paul say here? It's amazing. He says, the kingdom of God does not consist of words, but in power. Right? What an amazing thing. What do you desire? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love? See, Paul was willing to do both. Why? Not because he was an angry guy or he liked the power. No, God had given him that authority. God had given him that authority to where Paul knew that in his position he was to love, but he was also to what? To discipline, right? Because sheep, you know, we got to remember this. God is our shepherd, right? He is our good shepherd. God comforts me with his rod and God also does what corrects me with his rod, right? And the comforting and the correcting of God It's like a father to a son. What do I always tell my son? This is going to hurt you or hurt me more than it's going to hurt you, right? I'm disciplining and maybe he's even causing a little bit of emotional pain or this or that for your own well-being because I know the dangers behind this practice, you know, thinking these words that you're saying are right or this attitude or this behavior. I'm correcting this that may hurt You may not understand it. It may not feel good. It's not meant to, right? It's meant to make a point and to correct the behavior so that what? There can be healing, so that there can be a change of direction, so that you can be spared from more pain and trouble, like a parent, right? Why do I tell my son not to touch the pot as it's boiling with hot water? Because I don't want to have him experience fun things? No, because I know the minute he touches that pot, he's going to get burned, Right. And so sometimes I may even say, Zachary, don't touch that. Is that mean? Is that cruel? No, I'm getting my point across concisely. Right. If I were to just say, oh, Zachary, don't touch the pot. The pot's going to be hot. You know, he's not going to take me serious for one minute or he thinks it's just a game or it's fun. But if I come across and say, don't touch that pot. Right. What am I trying to be mean to him? Am I trying to, you know, be angry with him? No, I know the dangers of what you're trying to do. And I'm trying to forewarn you to get you to turn from those things. And if you're anything like me, hopefully my son's not. I touched the pot anyways and I would get burned. Why? Because I was stubborn, because I was hard headed and I had to learn a lot of things the hard way. It's funny though, the older I get, I'm finding that it's easier just to learn it the easy way. It's easier to just listen to it and do it instead of trying to push the line, right? Or let's try it again. Maybe that was a fluke last time, right? No, uh, you know, the older hopefully we get and not just older in age, older in our relationship with God, spiritually older. Hopefully we can understand those still quiet whispers that God usually gives us instead of the sharper rebukes or the stronger correction or God even saying, you know what, I'm going to just kind of remove my little sovereign protection for a minute and I'm just going to allow some of this uh, trouble to come upon you because what? 
Sin causes what? Death. It causes, there's consequences. Not that God isn't still there kind of hovering over, right? And ready for us to look back to Him and to cry out to Him, to rush in, to heal us, to save us, to forgive us and all of those things. But it's a scary thing. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God or to have the presence of the living God seem to be, you know, removed from you, right? That comfort that is no longer there anymore. I used to have peace, but now my peace is gone. Well, maybe God is allowing some of this because of some sin that's uh, crept in or unrepentant or things of this nature. And so back in uh, Numbers, what do we see here? Uh, they all take their rods, all of the leaders put their names on them, give them to Moses. I found an interesting verse here in verse 5. I didn't find it, but it just intrigued me when it says, God says, it will come about that the rod of the man whom I choose will sprout. He says, thus I will lessen from upon myself the grumblings of the sons of Israel who are grumbling against you. And I think it's amazing to me that God says, I will lessen from upon myself those who are grumbling. Remember, he already judged those who were rebellious. He swallowed them up. And then what did he do? He began to be displeased with those who were murmuring against his righteous judgment. And now God is saying almost in a way, uh, by choosing this rod, the one that buds, I'm going to lessen myself from the grumblings of the others. Now, does this mean that once the people see the rod whom God chooses and they're budding, that all of a sudden they're not never going to grumble again? They're never going to complain again? Well, if we continue reading our Bibles, we'll find out that's never the case, right? That they uh, they murmur, they grumble, God judges, they repent. Oh, we're sorry, we're sorry. And then they turn right back around, they do it again, and they do it again, and they do it again, right? Amazing stuff. And so it's not that God's saying, I'm going to squash this once and for all. It's never going to happen again. Uh, no, but God is teaching us a powerful lesson here. Uh, that God is going to put this rod that buds in the Ark of the Covenant that is going to be covered with the blood of that lamb, uh, that God is going to suffice this. He's already judged it, right? He's judged it now through the blood of the lamb, the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm getting ahead of myself. But God says, I'm going to lessen these things. What does it mean? God is saying, I'm demonstrating through the rod that I choose because this rod also was a symbol of, of God squashing this rebellion, judging it. But God says, I'm going to demonstrate and give you evidence by selecting this rod that buds and I'm going to give evidence to those that would murmur and those that would grumble that God no longer regards their grumbling, that He would judge the grumbling once and for all. They're still going to grumble. But in God's eyes, he has judged it. He's no longer going to regard their grumbling any longer. This was the picture of what this rod symbolizes, that God has no more regard for their grumbling. And really, the picture is, is he's going to judge it. Uh, And really, he judged it even through Christ Jesus, right? Who was the lamb of God, not just the lamb that would cover the sins of the nation. No, Jesus Christ, the lamb of God, died and took our sins completely away why is it that this little lesson of the rod that budded and the rebellion being squashed and the grumblers even being judged why was it not enough to keep people from continuing to grumble the same reason why sometimes we continue to complain and we continue to grumble even though god kind of makes things very clear that you know we need to change this or that and maybe we do but then we continue to find something else to grumble about. Some of us, maybe it was some of us before, or maybe uh, we're still like this today, that we just have a grumbling heart. We have a complaining heart. Uh, You can win a million dollars in the lottery and find something to complain about, right? It's just some people, they're just, they'll find anything and everything, and they bounce from, you know, you, you fix one thing and they complain about this. You fix that and they complain. You see, that's why you'll never stop a complainer uh, because it's not just some miraculous rod that buds that all of a sudden it's going to heal their grumbling no grumbling is a matter of the heart it's a picture and an evidence of an unsatisfied heart 
James talks about that. Why? What causes wars between you? It's because you lust after something and you can't have it. In other words, you're not satisfied. So when you're not satisfied, you're going to find a lot of things to complain about. When the bank account's zero, I have a lot to complain about because the bills don't care. They don't stop coming in even though the bank account's at zero, right? So it's like we will always have uh, something to complain about. And so it's, it's a heart. It's the heart of complaining. But when the heart is satisfied, right, we can learn to be content. We can say it is well with my soul. And so that's why even uh, very hard knocks in life, may for a time make us more joyful and happy. But then if it's not a true movement of the heart, a change of the heart, we're going to go right back into the same stuff again. That's why God uh, says, I'm going to lessen myself from these grumblers. Not that he removed them all and killed them all. No, God knew what they were going to continue to do. But in God's eyes, he's saying, I no longer have regard for this grumbling. I've judged it through Korah and his family. And I'm also going to judge it by putting that rod, a reminder of your rebellion in the ark, which I'm also going to pour the blood over that ark to cover your evilness, to cover your wickedness. What an amazing, amazing thing. And so God now gives this unmistakable answer to their grumbling, right? But how amazing, because a grumbler, though it's supplied, he or she supplied plenty of evidence Right? Evidence will never dissuade somebody from complaining. Why? Because it's a matter of the heart. doesn't matter how much proof you have, right? how much evidence you have. If you're a complainer by heart, you're going to complain. So even this lesson and this miracle that God does, that's why we have to be careful with miracles uh, because miracles don't change the heart. And this is what God points to in everything in his word that it's the heart that needs to change. Uh, not the circumstances, not the evidence, not the wowing and the wooing. It, it's it's God always showing us his word is a mirror to us that is constantly reminding us of those impurities. You know, when we start to grumble and murmur, read God's word, because a lot of times God will begin to show us maybe there's something else that's going on that will cure this complaining and grumbling and not just pacify it because the little i know god god isn't looking to just get the weed whacker and chop the tops of the weeds off those weeds that grow in our heart the the weeds of bitterness and resentment and complaining and anger and lust and all those things no god likes to get it from the root Uh, he likes to get it from the root why because that way it will never grow back again you just get it with the weed whacker it'll look good for a month or two and then You know, it's going to sprout right back up. You got to weed whack it again. No, God wants to get to the heart or the root of the issue and remove it. Because once that's removed, that's a picture of the heart being changed. It's no longer there. Uh, It's gone. And what God does is when he uproots a weed, you know what he puts in its place? A seed of something that is going to bear fruit, good fruit, Uh, not these weeds of wickedness. But he's going to begin to plant these seeds of righteousness that are going to begin to grow out of our hearts and we'll begin to what? Walk in the spirit. Our hearts will begin to change. Sure, we'll still struggle with struggle with complaining and, and anger and frustration and these sorts of things. But the spirit of God doesn't allow us to get away with those things anymore. The spirit of God begins to convict us and say, ah, uh, uh, our little root indicator starts going off and saying, hey, that root, that's, you know, it's not a good fruit. It's a bad fruit. Get rid of it. Then we have a choice, whereas before we had no idea. We just consumed everything, and then we wondered why everything was such a mess. Well, now God has given us a spirit of wisdom and discernment. Now we hopefully know better, or we're learning to know better, or we're being repetitive in having to learn to know better uh, the hard knocks of life. And so verse uh, 8 They all brought him in and then verse 8 says, Now on the next day when Moses went into the tent of testimony, behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi had not just sprouted, notice this, that it also produced buds and blossoms and it bore not just almonds, but ripe almonds. Tell me this isn't a miracle. You took a dead piece of wood, right, that wasn't even attached to a tree, a dead piece of wood, you put it in 
the tent of meeting or the tabernacle overnight. The next day you come in and not only did it just sprout a little tiny little green leaf, you know, which would have been enough for me like, whoa, you know, that's a miracle. No, God says, I'm going to make it super clear. <laughs> I'm not just going to produce, produce a little tiny sprout like on those potatoes, you know, the ones that I cut off and dig out a little bit and still eat the potato. Some of them are kind of long. Melissa's like, throw it away. I'm like, no. no, I'm not talking about that kind of little sprout. It says that it not only sprouted. But it had buds, it had blossoms, it produced almonds, and not just almonds, ripe almonds, ready to eat. What an amazing picture. God says, I'm going to take away all your excuses. I'm going to eliminate every excuse you have. I'm going to make it so clear in a 24-hour period, I'm going to guess. Let's just give God the benefit of the doubt. 24 hours he was able to do that. God's saying, I want everyone to to know for sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that I've selected Aaron. (laughs) What an amazing thing. And and see, this is what I love about God. And this picture of God doing these supernatural things and going above and beyond trying to take away any excuses or doubts that people may have. God doesn't just do things in small ways does he he can he chooses sometimes to but what we find more times than not is that god does things just like this he goes above and beyond he gives us above and beyond really what we need you see god didn't just sprout this rod no He fully bloomed it, blossomed it, put almonds on it, and ripe almonds. You see, the Bible says in Ephesians 3.20, Paul says, To him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all we ask or think. God is able to do extraordinary things. And God does do extraordinary things. You see Romans uh, chapter 1, verse 20, God in His creation has done extraordinary things. And in Romans 1, 20, God reminds us all this. He says, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. God has gone gone overboard, hasn't He? With this creation... (laughs) It's a masterpiece. It's second to absolutely none. What other planet out there is there that is as great as the planet Earth? What other planet out there inhabits life that we know of? (laughs) The Earth. All the planets we can see, you can't inhabit, though NASA continues to try to find one that we can ship people to, right? (laughs) You want to volunteer to go live on Mars? Some people already live on Mars, right? But God has displayed his invisible attributes. I mean, God goes overboard with everything. Why? It's because it's who he is. Says they clearly been seen and being understood through what has been made so that doesn't come with the cost, though, does it? The Bible says that the heavens declare what the glory of God. He says here so that they are without. Excuse. God did all this for his glory, but also it makes man accountable. Now you are without excuse. Just like Aaron's rod that budded, God went above and beyond trying to do what? To show his power and authority so that the people would be without excuse. Though some would still find excuses. Well, what did we just talk about? God says he will not regard it any longer. He will not regard it. You're going to stand before him one day and you and I and the whole world will answer before God. Why? Because he has authority over everything, even over creation. So people will be without excuse. How about this in Luke, the gospel of Luke? The Bible says this in Luke chapter 6 at verse 37. Jesus says, do not judge and you will not be judged and do not condemn and you will not be condemned. 
pardon and you will be pardoned. Look at this verse 38. It says, give and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. <laughs> you see, that's the God-like quality. God doesn't just sprinkle us with a little drop of the Holy Spirit, does he? No, when God fills us with the Holy Spirit, this is what he does here. When we give ourselves to him, what does he do? He pours into our lap. He doesn't just fill us with the Spirit. The Spirit then overflows through us. Right? Because that's how God does things. For you, uh, for by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. What an amazing thing. Some people think very little of God. And that's probably why they receive very little from God. But those who do what? Who see God enormously and great? Well, usually those people receive. That's what he's saying here. Right? To your standard of measure will be measured to you. How big is your God? Right? How big is your God? Well, how big your God is, is the same equation of how your life is going to be seen through your eyes. Are we walking around thinking we're defeated and conquered? Well, then maybe we're not measuring ourselves right. Because you can't, you know, and I'm guilty of this sometimes. Sometimes problems that I think I have overwhelm me. We're no different. But a lot of times I need to be reminded, is this problem that I'm going through bigger than my God? Because if my problem is bigger than my God, then I'm worshiping the wrong God. Because our God is bigger than any problem we have. And when we see it that way, we'll receive it that way. It will change us. Uh, not that we're going to bury our heads in the sand, no. But we're going to have what? The comfort of God. The assurance of God. And those are very powerful things. That's what God wants to give to us. What an amazing thing. How about this? In Acts... Being accountable, being responsible, God gives to us without measure. But look at this in the book of Acts, chapter 1. Here's another amazing thing. Speaking of Aaron's rod budding, this miracle, God making it super clear. Acts chapter 1, at verse 3, he says to these, actually let's start at verse 1, says the first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. Listen to this. To these, the apostles, he also presented himself alive after his suffering. Look at this. By many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of things concerning the kingdom of of God. Men will be without excuse. God has provided many proofs. Even the apostles here uh, were given many proofs of Jesus and his deity and his resurrection and the orders now, the commands that he had now given these apostles. Many convincing proofs. You see, I'm a firm believer that we come to God by faith. It's the only way we can. We've been looking at that on Sundays. We have to first believe that he is God. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we come to him by faith. And then once we do, that opens the gate. We're coming through Jesus now, right? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one will come to the Father but through Jesus. So now we're coming to God through Jesus. His blood uh, has now uh, done what? Atoned for my sins. I'm now right with God. I can be born again with the Holy Spirit. And what does God do? He begins to do what? Show us these convincing proofs. You're not going to have proof before you believe. Remember, that was Thomas's mistake. I'll believe it when I see it. God says, uh-uh. It's believing it to see it. You want to see it, you have to believe it. And when you believe it, God isn't going to give you a little trickle of it. In fact, it'll be the rest of our lives that God is going to continue to pour into us, give us revelation, give us a deeper understanding and love for him why? Because God doesn't just do anything small. It may start small, like that mustard seed of faith. But what happens with the mustard seed of faith? God says you can move mountains, 
right? You can move mountains with the mustard seed of faith. What a powerful thing. What a powerful thing. And so God here, he makes it evident. Um, he comes in, Moses comes in, Aaron's rod is, is packed with almonds and everything else. Look at verse 9, it says, Then Moses brought out all the rods. This is fascinating to me. Because God didn't just have Moses bring the one rod out and say, Aha, you know, it's Aaron. No, he brought all 12 of them out. Even those leaders whose rods didn't bud. And he handed those to those leaders because a lot of times people need what? Proof. <laughs> they need the evidence. And so we don't want to just trust that Moses went in there and, you know, cut all the other sprouts off the other ones and came out with Aaron's because after all, it's his brother, right? No, God handed, Moses handed the other guys. So now they're having to handle it and look at it and say, mine didn't sprout. Right? God making it clear uh, that Aaron was his selection. Right? Why is God doing all this? To play a game? No. Remember the rebellion? God's saying, in case you were wondering that Korah's family might have been kind of right in all this, but they got wrongly judged, God says, no, I'm going to make it clear by not only my judgment, but also by my selection. I'm going to make it clear, not just through my judgment, but through my selection. Aaron has been selected in his family. And I always ask myself questions like this. Maybe you do too. You know, how does God choose Aaron? You know, why did God choose Aaron to be the high priest? Was Aaron the more spiritual one? That's why God chose Aaron? Because sometimes we think that, right? Why is that person being blessed so much or this or that? You know, surely they must just be filled with the spirit and, you know, they must be the most spiritual person. That's how we kind of think, right? That good things bring good rewards and they do. That's biblical. But not necessarily when God chooses. He didn't choose Aaron, I don't believe, because Aaron was going to be the best high priest. I believe why God chose Aaron is because of this. Paul actually records it for us in uh, 1 Timothy. You see, Aaron wasn't perfect. We read a couple stories about Aaron and Miriam who did what? Rebelled against Moses. So God didn't choose Aaron because he was super spiritual or he was perfect. God knows. Uh, we know Aaron was not perfect. Or like the Catholic Church who thinks the Pope or the Papal is what? Infallible? What a joke. What a joke. That's why he's the Pope, because he's infallible, because he's what a joke. That's a lie from the pit of hell. No man is good. The Bible says no, not one. <laughs> Jesus Christ is the only righteous, holy one. I'm not picking on the Catholic Church, but I'm making this point. God didn't select Marin, Aaron because Aaron was infallible. No, Aaron sinned. But here's the difference. When Aaron sinned, he repented of his sin, didn't he? He cried out to God. He submitted himself to God. You see, that's what a man or a woman who God chooses or appoints is. He begins to um, model this God-like behavior. You see, God knows and knew, knew us before we were born, right? The Bible says that. The Bible also says that God chose us before the foundations of the world. God saved us. Wait a minute. How did God know I was going to turn out this way? Well, remember, God has foreknowledge. That God has no beginning and no end. But how does God select? A lot of it is based upon the character. It's the character. That's what Paul says in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 3. In fact, Paul says here is going to be the qualities of a leader whom I choose. He says in 1 Timothy 3 verse 1, he says it's a trustworthy statement if any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. Verse 2, an overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? Verse 6, 
and now uh, and not a new convert or he will uh, become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil and he must be a uh, have a good reputation with those outside of the church so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil and then he goes on to talk about deacons and so we call these qualifications right uh, these are qualifications and what's interesting to me is is we may not always check every single box on that because we're not perfect but here's what we are is this is what we are working towards this is what god is working in us it's the same with aaron god chooses people why well you may say because they're beginning to exuberate or beginning to display the very character of god you look at moses as a perfect example when god called moses moses was a murderer <laughs> Moses was hiding. Moses was scared. He was for, full of fear. What did God do? God began to do what? Through experiences, through time, through trial, through uh, failures, God was shaping Moses into the man that he would become. And then Moses began to what? To show this character. Right? That's what God is doing with each and every one of us. God is doing what? He's changing us more and more into the image and likeness of of christ what a beautiful thing he's conforming us into his image and so what a beautiful beautiful thing this is god doesn't choose people because they're perfect god doesn't choose people because they're more spiritual god chooses those who do what who call upon his name those who surrender their lives to him those who it may be fearful to let something go to confess something or to give it to him we give it to him and what do we find? We find that God begins to use us. God begins to mold us. God begins to shape us. God begins to change us. And the next thing we know, we're being conformed into the man and woman that God saw in us before the creation of time. What an amazing, amazing thing that is. And so each man took his rod. Each man saw that theirs, the other 11, did not produce and Aaron's did. And here's where we close. Because of these pictures that I say, you know, the Bible says of why this rod is so significant. Remember, the rod was a picture of God no longer considering or dealing with these grumblers. God judged them right through the family of Korah, uh, the ones that still continued to grumble. Here's this beautiful picture. God says, this symbol of my judgment the symbol of my authority, I want you now to put in the Ark of the Covenant. I want you to put it in with the Ten Commandments and in with the jar of manna and I want you to put the mercy seat over it. Look at this picture, guys, because as God was in heaven, right? God is spirit. He's everywhere. But to Israel and to us, God is in heaven, right? He's here too, but His throne's in heaven. As God looks down from heaven, and he looks down at the Ark of the Covenant. What does he see? Well, he sees the Ten Commandments that Israel broke. <laughs> he sees the jar of manna as he's looking down at the Ark of the Covenant. He sees the jar of manna that what? The people complained about. They said, we don't want this manna anymore. We want meat. We're tired of this manna. When they looked down, when God looked down, he saw that rod. He saw the rebellion. He saw the complaining. But here's what's beautiful. Why God said put those in the Ark of the Covenant and cover it with the mercy seat. The place where God dwelt was above the Ark of the Covenant. There between the two cherubim on the lid of the mercy seat. It's where the Spirit of God was said to dwell. So as God looked down, He saw all the sin and the evil and the wickedness of His people. He was reminded of it. And it was placed there for them to remember. But as he looked down, once a year, that high priest would come through the veil, would approach the ark with the blood of an innocent lamb. And he would take that blood and he would drop it where? On the mercy seat. So that as God looked down and he saw their sin and their rebellion and their evil, as that blood was applied, guess what God did? He covered their sin. 
he would no longer strike them and hold them accountable for that sin because of that blood. So as God looks down at you and I, (laughs) what does he see? Well, he probably still sees some areas where we need to improve or maybe something we need to confess that's what? Holding us back. It's not holding God back. God's plans are going to march on. God's will is going to be done. We're the ones who are suffering through our own sin, complaining, rebellion, right? We're the ones who are being held back. We're holding ourselves back. But what does God see when we do what? When we've received Jesus Christ as our sacrifice. Well, he sees the blood. He's able to forgive our sins. Remember this one last little point I want to make. If God stopped remembering, if God was able to forget things, then I would say he's not God. So then how does God forget our sins? He says he will remember them no more. Think about this. He chooses to remember them no more. He can't forget about them. He's God. He chooses to remember them no more. And guess what? His judgment of his choosing is righteous because those sins have been atoned for. So when he looks down from heaven now at you and I, what does he see? He sees Christ. He sees the atoning sacrifice, the blood that covers us as he conforms us into that very image. What an amazing, amazing God. Aren't you glad here tonight that you've come to know this living God? I know I am. Because even when I'm going through difficult times, you know what? He is my good shepherd. Not only did he pull me back from the cliff several thousands of times when I ran off on the cliff like that stupid sheep, But knowing that he had that staff, he has that staff even now, knowing that he's seated at the right hand of the Father brings me great comfort. You know, there's a picture. I may post it on Facebook later. I thought it was very accurate. I don't remember where it came from, but it was a picture of this lady. It was a cartoon-looking picture. And she was in like a, you know, a hotel or something that was overlooking the city. And she was pulling back the curtain like this. And she was looking out, and all she saw was fire and smoke and just, carnage and you know junk going on and it said something about being able to find peace in the mix midst of a world that is falling apart you know the only way you can find peace in the midst of this world that is kind of falling apart notice it's not just like california it's not just like the united states it's all around the world Where can you find comfort and peace in a world that's falling apart? There's only one place. You can find it in the good shepherd, in Jesus. Why? Because that rod, that staff, they comfort me. It doesn't make me excited and and I'm joyful to see all the carnage and destruction, though it does remind me that we're drawing nearer, so there is kind of a, you know, it's kind of a, a mixed bag. But there is this comfort knowing that if it gets worse, you know what? That rod, that staff, it comforts me. Right? What an amazing thing. You can only find that in Christ, nowhere else. That's why we continue to preach the gospel. We continue to just love him. And, and you know, it's it's funny because it's not, it's not like I even teach the Bible anymore. <laughs> you know, I, I don't consider it teaching the Bible anymore. I just consider it. You know, I love continuing to understand more and more about God and just trying to share that with people. It's amazing. And and I do it here, but I do it everywhere. I don't just put on the pastor hat and do it here. No, I do it everywhere. Why? Because I believe the Word of God. Because I've come to know the author of the Word of God. I've been convinced with many proofs. Many proofs throughout my life that all came about by faith. The faith of a mustard seed when a crazy-looking hippie guy in Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley, spoke words just like I did tonight, and every single one of those words penetrated my heart. And I did what? I responded to an invitation to come and know this God. My life has never been the same since. Not perfect. 
Not exactly the way I thought it would go. <laughs> Not without uh, valleys and mountains and all the heartache. In fact, I don't think I've been more broken and crushed than that of a Christian. It's an interesting life, but I'll tell you what. There is a satisfaction. There's a comfort. There's a peace. There's an assurance that you can only have and experience through knowing him. Why? Because he's that good shepherd and that rod, that staff. Even now, when there needs to be correction and discipline, if it gets heavier and harder, it's only because of my own doing. <laughs> it's because I didn't simply hear God say, don't do that. Right? If I don't listen, then of course, you know, he loves me, so he's going to maybe break a leg. Right? That's what he would do to those little sheep that kept wandering off. You think, how mean! Snap his leg. Why would he snap his leg? So he can't run off. But then the beautiful picture of that shepherd, what would he do? Would he tie a leash around the thing and drag it on its three legs? Learn your lesson the hard way, chump. No. Not the good shepherd. He'd pick it up, he'd put it around his neck, and he'd carry it. So that when that little sheep's leg was healed and he was placed back down on the ground, you know what that sheep did? He never left the shepherd's side. Why? Because thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. What an amazing, amazing thing. And so let's pray here tonight and we'll get back together Sunday and uh, hopefully share more about the great love that our God has for us. Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege and honor of just being able to call you Father. And what a good Father you are. I had a great, still have a great earthly Father but he would even agree that he falls short, just as I know I fall short as a father. No father compares to you, God, our good father, who knew us before we were even born, who saw the finished work before we even took our first breath. That alone brings me great comfort. God, I never sought after you. I was living my life uh, trying to experience who I was and finding my own way. It was you who reached down in my greatest time of need and spoke the true lives of life, the true words of life to me. What an amazing thing, God, that here we are, what, some 28 years later. And I would like to think that my relationship with you has only grown, grown stronger and closer. And I look forward to the Many years or the few years that we have left, I don't know. No man knows. But I know that my future is bright, not because I can make it bright, but because you're bright, because I'm yours, Lord. You have us coming to something, coming to you. And so, Father, wherever we're at tonight, I pray that you would just Continue to be faithful in our lives. Your word says that you who began the good work, you began it, God. That you are also the one who's faithful to complete it. Sometimes I feel like it needs to be completed now. But Lord, your timing is perfect. And so we trust you. And we love you and we praise you and we thank you. Go with us now, I pray, Lord. Bless us as you always do. Continue to bless us. Flow in us and through us that we may now touch and impact others. That they could come and experience the forgiveness of their sins. They can experience being born again. They can experience their heart beginning to change. And so, Father, continue to bind us together this tapestry that is the church, that you would continue to weave together this beautiful tapestry. Keep us humble, Father. Help us to continue to hate sin because we begin to see it the way that you see it. Father, we love you. I do pray for the Scribner family. God, you know all the details. We don't. I'm not even going to pretend to know. And truly these days we really don't know how much we can trust of anything anymore. <laughs> but what I do know is there's some hurting going on. 
And so, Father, I pray that you would penetrate much deeper than the law enforcement or the news would ever be able to find out, that you would penetrate all the hearts involved. Lord, that you would forgive, you'd cleanse, you would comfort, you'd correct whatever's going on. I know them to be godly people, Christians. Zach used to attend this church many, many years ago, his wife and his family. So, Father, help them. We plead the blood of Jesus over that family. Such a public affair. Oh, man, I, it's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. People are going to tear and criticize, and it's going to be horrible for the kids. So, God, just begin to protect. Watch over them. We love you, Jesus. We thank you, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.